Welcome to A Window on Samri, where we take you inside South Australia's independent not-for-profit health and medical research institute. Each episode, we get to know the people driving our life-changing research, getting into what motivates them personally and how their work is delivering a brighter, healthier future for all. Tim, why did you want to be a scientist? I've always, for as long as I can remember, wanted to be a scientist. Some of my earliest memories are... Uh, or of gifts that encourage science or discussions about science. So my, my dad gave me a, a microscope, I remember. I can't remember how, how old I was. I was. I was a young boy, seven or eight. And I can remember him showing me uh, slides of pollen, looking at pollen cells. And, and I can even remember him quite vividly getting a pin out and pricking his own thumb and smearing his blood over the <laughs> microscope slide. And we, we had a good look at that. So, so it was a lot of fun. And um, what, what fascinated you about that from an early age? I, I'm not sure. I was just always intrigued by it. We always had discussions around the house. Um, so my dad was a gardener about plant biology and, and about things that you couldn't necessarily see, like plant genetics and, and how plants grow. And from that, I, I, I guess I just developed an affinity towards biology and, and towards life sciences. Later on, I did a, a paper on to save up enough for a telescope. And looking at stars, for me, is the same thing. You know, you, you see them in the sky, but you don't know much about them. They're just kind of points of light in the sky, right? But if you study them for long enough, you, you develop an appreciation for what they are, how far away they are, and the, the processes that contribute towards them being there. It's the same as life. It's, it's very similar. So is this what you were really fascinated by throughout your schooling life? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I always stuck to the sciences. In retrospect, I should have done more English. <laughs> That's a, if there's anything that I could tell a young scientist now, it would be to practice writing and become good at writing. But, but what I was passionate about was science. I did physics, chemistry, biology. I dropped physical education so I could do agriculture and horticulture. Again, if I could go back and tell myself. <laughs> it's, it's important to have the, oh gosh. the whole picture. Yeah, yeah, you need a balance. You need physical exercise. That's really important. But at the time, I was just absolutely taken with science. Um, is there a personal connection that inspires the work that you do now? I, I guess what we do at SAMRI is we're, we're trying to delay age-related disease. That, that's what our research really is all about. And everyone, I think, is touched by age-related disease. Everyone knows somebody who's had a heart attack or who's, who's had cancer or, or dementia. And then everyone worries about what's going to happen to, to their parents or, or to them eventually. So I think studying age-related disease and ageing really involves everybody. Uh, so in that way, I, I do feel concerned about what's going to happen to my parents and me. Who's that person for you? Probably my dad. My mum's in great shape, to be honest. <laughs> I worry about my father and what, what's going to happen to him in the next five or ten years. And I, I do think about that when, when I research what we do. And have you had a family member with dementia or heart disease or cancer? Cancer, more more is what takes out my family members. My, my grandfather died of a massive heart attack. Dementia, not so much, but my wife's family, for example, have had quite a few dementia cases, so I think about that too. And how have you been impacted losing family to those conditions? Fortunately, that hasn't happened recently, but when I was a boy growing up, I remember my uncle passing of cancer, for example, and that was, I can remember that affecting me. I was quite young, maybe 10 or 11 then. So whatever I can do to delay or get rid of those diseases, they're, they're, that's a part of what drives me. What else drives you? I love biology. I love astronomy. Another thing that I really take notice of is, is the space industry and watching how that's progressed in the last few years with Elon Musk, for example, being able to land rockets and, and doing so, making space travel cheaper and, um, and more affordable and more within reach of, of business. That excites me. So... Technological progress uh, is what I, what I get out of bed for. Do you still see health as a similar frontier to space? Like obviously we've been working on yeah. health for a lot longer, but there seems like there's a lot that's still undiscovered. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that becomes quite difficult to talk about with, with regards to, to health and medicine in some of the fields that we work in. So there have been great breakthroughs. So cancer is a, is a great example. There, there have been massive breakthroughs with cancer and where people can either live with the disease or it's, or it's all but cured. However, dementia is an, a completely different story. We've been researching dementia for over 100 years. There are some medications that can affect signs in some people, but there's nothing really at the moment that can slow the progression of the disease despite all this research. Now, just in defense of this research field, we understand a, a lot, lot more 
about dementia than what we did even 10, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But we're still obviously not at a place where we can slow or stop the progression of the disease. What's uniquely different about dementia that makes it so difficult to crack? I think, and, and this is true to a large extent for any age-related disease, but I guess dementia involves the brain and that takes it up a notch. Dementia for me is hard because it's multifactorial. And what I mean by that is that by the time you've been diagnosed with dementia, that disease has actually been developing your brain for about 20 years and it involves several things working at the same time. So for example, the accumulation of toxic or sticky molecules in your brain to make things that scientists call plaques. Also, there's a lot of inflammation in your brain and also a lot of the cells in your brain have already died by the time you get a diagnosis of dementia. So coming in at that stage and trying to fix things is, is just super challenging. And I think that's a large part of the difficulty in what we've been trying to do. And that's why it's so crucial to develop modes like autophagy to try to predict things more accurately. I know now we can detect that plaque in the brain. Yeah. You might be able to predict 20 years into the future and mm. we can now tell people whether or not they have that plaque in their brain. That's right. But that, that's not necessarily consistent with whether or not they'll definitely get the yeah. measure. Yeah. So it's just, it's not that simple. Yeah, correct, correct. We definitely have to develop more technology around these other factors that come into play with dementia. So as you, as you said, we can look into someone's brain now and say whether or not they have different kinds of sticky and toxic molecules in their brain. And as you also said, that may or may not lead to dementia later on. So what we need to do is try to understand these other factors like autophagy, which is recycling within the cell, the, the brain's immune system, which plays a huge role in dementia, and like other things like energy metabolism. So for example, in dementia, neurons don't take up glucose as well. They're not as insulin sensitive as what they should be. So there, there's um, huge spaces of unknown here that we really need to get on top of. That makes it exciting and interesting. At least it's never dull. Yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of work to do, that's for sure. So. What's it like to work in a field with such delayed gratification? Like you say, people who've been working on dementia for a, a hundred years still haven't got the result that they're after and yeah. everything that you're working on is for the future and often decades ahead. What's it like to work on that every day? That makes it difficult sometimes because you slog away at it and, and you can go quite a while without a major breakthrough. That's just the nature of the field. It's hard. I guess what you do is you, you delight in the small things. So for example, a couple of years ago, somebody in my group, uh, Dr. Julian Benslam, was able to measure cell recycling process autophagy in a person for the first time. And I can remember being at the pub with him and a few other people and saying, wow, we just measured this in a person. And the, I could feel the excitement around the group. And so these, I guess, smaller breakthroughs are exciting for us. But your lab was the first in the world to measure autophagy in humans, so kind yeah. of a big deal. Yeah, absolutely, in, in a physiological relevant way. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll just unpack that. Um, so people have been able to measure autophagy in something called tissue culture. So scientists grow cells from tissue in petri dishes in the lab. And um, you can measure autophagy, the, the cell recycling process, in cells in the lab fairly easily because you can do whatever you want to a cell in the lab. However, measuring this in, in a... A human or a piece of a human, and by a piece I mean a blood sample, <laughs> so just to clarify that, <laughs> is what well, was a lot harder and it took a couple of years of development to, to get off the ground. The rest of the time when you're sort of in the, the wasteland in between having yeah. an idea and then executing and having it turn into a reality uh, and you've got all those hundreds and thousands of days where you're just working at it but yeah. you're not sure if it's going to work out, what do you get frustrated by and, and what allows you to, to continue to stay focused? Yeah, I, I guess you, you, you can get a bit low, that's for sure. That's especially true for young people. So if you get a, a PhD student on board, so a PhD takes about three or four years worth of research and then a PhD student writes up their findings at the end and that's the thesis that gets them the, the PhD. But in between, you've got three years of, of lab work. And often the first year for a young person is exciting because it's all new. And then there's something called the second year blues, which is when things haven't worked for a while. And when you don't have that experience of this is normal, things will get better as, as you work, work hard and try and work these problems out. Some people get really low because there's 
there's no gratification for, for a year or two. And I imagine you can blame yourself. Yeah. Even though it's, it's a normal experience that's part of the process, but yeah. some young scientists I'm sure can get down on themselves and I think that they're not cut out for it or yeah. it's not progressing because of something to do with them. Yeah. And, and in science too, your job becomes your identity but because you love it, because you're so passionate about it, because that's what you do at work. It's what you do after dinner. It's almost everything your whole life. Because um, it requires so much dedication yeah. and thought. Yeah, when it doesn't go so well, that, that's, that, that can be the gut punch sometimes because you've pinned everything on that and it's not working. So do you have any part of your role where you're speaking to younger scientists and trying to talk them through some of these tough times or giving them advice? Do you play that part? Yeah, absolutely. So if I'm sitting down with a PhD student and I can see that they're a bit down, you can see it on their face and, and in the way they, they talk. They say things like, look, this is, this is normal and it's going to get better. Don't worry about it. You know, we're here. And it's okay. So, and I encourage them to speak freely. And you remember going through that phase yourself? Yeah. Obviously you're quite experienced now, been around for a while, done a lot. But do you remember that, that second year yourself? I absolutely, yeah. I remember things, just getting into a bit of a rut, things not working so well, and just needing to kind of lift my head up and, and think about things clearly. Uh, sometimes it, it really helps just to step back and to look at everything in total and Try to come up with some new ideas. Have you had some eureka moments along the way? Anything you can share with us where it's that, that stereotypical Hollywood moment where you, you work it out and it all sort of comes together? This was in the UK a few years ago. I, in one particular moment, I can remember working on brains from a condition that causes neurodegeneration in children. And we were looking for cell death. So we were looking for parts of the brain that were dying. And and we hadn't had a lot of success, but after uh, quite a few months of just tweaking things and trying to figure out what, why we weren't seeing what we should have been seeing, and then looking down the microscope uh, when it finally started working, and this, this marker that we'd put on the brains showing where these cells were dying, I remember that very clearly looking down the microscope and thinking, yeah, this is it, we've just nailed it, we've just seen something that, that no one else has seen. And that, that, was, that was really exciting. How do you describe that? feeling after you've been looking for it for so long yeah yeah it's excitement because it's so delayed it's delayed gratification and you've been working so hard to do something and sometimes you can get quite low about it but then when it finally clicks into place and works yeah it's probably one of the most exciting things that can happen to you how, how long does that last about a day yeah. <laughs> and then, then you get back to work kind of like when you get a new car <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely and then you think okay what, what do i need to do to get this into a peer-reviewed publication and is part of it that you're always chasing that feeling like you wouldn't maybe think of it that yeah, way i'd be lying if i said that you weren't biased towards chasing exciting things you can become distracted by by exciting things i yeah. definitely agree with that yeah how's aging connected to chronic disease so this sounds a bit silly to say but it's true and it has to be said Aging is the largest risk factor for diseases like dementia and atherosclerosis. So some of the so athero, um, so cardiovascular disease is the number one killer of men in Australia. Dementia is the number one killer of women in Australia, and aging is the number one risk factor for these diseases. And if I were just to unpack what aging is, when I say aging, I actually mean biological aging, because everyone knows somebody who's aged well, you know, you want to be like that person. They, they look great for their age. But that and actually happens at a cellular absolutely, level. Absolutely, absolutely. So your body is made up of tissues like muscle, liver, brain, and those tissues are made up of cells. And it's actually the cells that do the jobs that make that tissue function. So for example, I can grab my, my mobile phone because cells have machinery that make my muscles contract. And that machinery over time becomes damaged. And that's what biological aging is. So biological aging, it actually involves a group of known processes that deteriorate over time to cause biological aging. However, your body uh, has some fantastic defenses against this. So one of those defenses is what we study. It's called the lysosomal system. And you can think of it like the cell's recycling system or the cell's stomach. What it does is it takes, through a process called autophagy, it takes unwanted and damaged molecules and um, by molecules you can think of these as little machines that work inside the cell that become damaged it takes those little cellular machines and degrades them and pulls them into their constituent parts for reuse in the cell so hence the term recycling and we're doing it right now which means that we're aging much slower than what we would be if we weren't doing this process called autophagy and why does autophagy have potential to be 
such a more effective predictor of healthy aging than what we currently have at our disposal? I think that's because autophagy is a quality control process that lies upstream of everything that goes wrong. So in preclinical work, so by preclinical work, I mean when scientists work on animals in, in the lab, they've been able to show that if you take autophagy away from an animal, that its tissues degenerate quite quickly and it makes any age-related disease worse. So if you've got a mouse that gets the plaques in the brain that we talked about before, which are the hallmarks of some dementias, if you take away autophagy, then it has more plaques. If you have a mouse that has cardiovascular disease, if you take away autophagy, then it has worse cardiovascular disease. So there's a lot of work that scientists have been working on for the past, say, 20 years or so, and all of it's showing that when you're healthy, the more autophagy you do, the better, the slower you'll age biologically. And if we can accomplish that in people, it's likely that we'll be able to delay the onset of age-related diseases, such as atherosclerosis and dementia. Where do you see this all going in terms of the big picture stuff, like long term? Aging as a, as a field, as a field of biology, is, is really starting to accelerate. So, for example, people might have heard of Altos Labs studying rejuvenation factors that, that hold a lot of promise for, for making cells of your body younger. We have other tools like clocks that can accurately predict your biological age. And, and what we're working on, bio, um, sorry, autophagy, my ultimate goal is to be able to make it such that clinicians can test your autophagy and say, hey, that's a bit low. And you need to increase it in these ways, either with medication or lifestyle interventions. And in so doing, they can use that to reduce your risk of age-related disease later in life. That, that's my ultimate vision. And how is the everyday person going to be able to apply autophagy to their lives in a way that they're going to understand and, and see benefit from in the future? Yeah, well, that's what's really exciting about autophagy. So if I can take a few steps back, uh, I want to kind of describe a bit more about the biology and about uh, why this is the case, why it's applicable to everyone's lives. So autophagy, it does a couple of things, actually. So it, it slows biological aging, but it's also responsible for keeping you alive if you're starving. And the reason for that is because it can grab cellular machines and break them up into molecules and your body can use that for energy to survive. But because of that, autophagy is acutely aware of the nutritional status of your body such that it's more activated when there's less nutrients. Now that means that you can either use drugs that target those pathways to activate autophagy or you can do things like Possibly, and this is where we're investigating this right now, but I think it's likely that you'll be able to use exercise and nutritional interventions to increase autophagy in, in a way that everybody can do without using drugs. Because we already know exercise is good and eating healthy is what we should do. Yeah. But this will be more specific. Mm. Like it'll be on a more of a case by case basis where, so. say, a clinician will be able to look at someone's autophagy results and eventually say, you know, you should be eating on this kind of a regime, like your, your fasting window should be X to X versus yeah. someone else and break it down with that level of specificity. Yeah. So there, there's research in those fields right now, and we're collaborating with people at SAMRI. So Professor Leonie Helbron's one of them, and we're looking at autophagy with either intermittent fasting or calorie restriction. So we hope to have those results out later this year, but we're certainly looking at these nutritional interventions. We're also launching two human studies right now at SAMRI that are looking at nutritional interventions with a view to boosting autophagy in people. What's it like to be part of driving something that's so significant? There's huge potential here because scientists have been working on this really hard for decades, but what hasn't happened yet is people haven't really moved into, into human biology in a big way. People haven't measured humans and asked the question, how can we boost this process in humans? So because the field's so wide open, because there's so much opportunity and potential here, I mean, that, that really excites me, that, that we could actually make a difference to ageing and, and healthy ageing. I, I see a, a huge opportunity here to increase people's health spans. And because the nature of the beast is that the work's never done, are you able to yeah. take stock of how far you've come and enjoy the journey, or are you sort of perpetually dissatisfied? Um, probably a mixture. There's moments where you look at, probably when you publish a paper, when you publish a good scientific paper, which is a years long process. When you get to the end of that and you finally see it out in a journal, out where other, your scientists can read it, you think, wow, that was, that, that was an accomplishment. 
but you do think I'm constantly, I guess, worried about you know caveats with our work because I'll think you know we're doing all this great work, ah, but there's this molecule here or this this reason that we really have to investigate quickly. So that's always in the back of your mind. So you're always driving to make sure what you're studying is is robust. And I suppose it can never happen fast enough as well. And yeah. Obviously, science is renowned for things happening slowly. That's right. Yeah. If you have an idea that you you can do in the lab on on cells or in animals. It typically takes about 20 years to get that idea all the way through to humans, to, to a place where humans, where people can use it in the, in the clinic or in their everyday lives. It just takes that much work to get up. And especially when you get into human trials and clinical trials, that, that's when uh, those things take years to, to pull off successfully. Which is frustrating for, I'm sure, yourself and the general public, but all these things are being worked on. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's just it, it takes so much time because there's so many different variables to have to take into account and think about, and things have to be safe before they they can be approved. And yeah, safe, safe and understood. There are lots of things about age-related biology that we don't understand very well, and I think lots of ways that it could go wrong. So we really want to to know everything we can about this biology before before people are using it. How does the collaboration at Samri speed things up? So Samri is unique in that it has a real breadth of scientists who do things in different ways. So I, I guess to the public, I'm, I'm not sure how much the public know, to be honest, but there are definitely different kinds of scientists. So I'm, I'm what's called a cell biologist. I look down a microscope at cells. And I look at fairly abstract systems. But what we've been able to do at Samri is work with people who work with human beings, either in the clinic or through human clinical studies. What that means is that I can bring my expertise in cell biology and processes that work at the cellular level that affect aging, and I can say, hey, I've got this idea, we can test it out in people. That accelerates things massively, because what I think does happen is that scientists can get into silos, um, scientists talk to other scientists who are like themselves, and then that work stays in abstract systems. But at Samri, we've got opportunities and the ability to Port really cool ideas across to human beings. And what do you think of your fellow scientists at Samri who do a different kind of science to what you do? I mean, we, we've got great scientists at Samri, and it, it's always interesting getting into conversations with them because you, you always learn a lot because they, they work in different fields to you. So we did a study at Samri uh, with uh, Associate Professor Mackinnon. He, he's a computer scientist. And we wanted to know whether or not our biology was re related to Alzheimer's disease. So he was able to get genetic data from 60,000 different people and tell us that, yeah, our process, th there's a genetic signature which, which tracks back to the disease. And that's something that I couldn't do. Um, I work with microscopes, you know. So that really validated our, our research direction. So that was hugely influential. So pretty handy to just have those connections yeah, just, at your disposal. Just there in, in the kitchenette, down the cafe, yeah, or, or at the pub later on, so... Yeah. And why are you doing the Bright Walk? Because I think it's also important for scientists to reach out to the public. I think the Bright Walk will be important for promoting what SAMRI does, for encouraging more understanding in the community about what, what happens at SAMRI and why that's important. I, I personally think scientists don't do enough of this. They don't reach out to the public and, and try to make meaningful connections enough. And I think the Bright Walk's a really important part of that. What do you think of the community coming together to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars for health research? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's critical. That, that's really important. Health funding is, can be hard to come by. And when the community gets behind SAMRI and, and researchers like us, then it is a huge morale boost. And, and also the, the funding is, of course, important to keep the work going. So what do you do when you're not at work, when you're not in the lab or... Yeah, in the office. I like running or going to the gym, but I, I enjoy trail running. Um, that's that's really fun. I'm just just getting out. I guess I'm a fairly solitary guy. <laughs> Astronomy as well, so I like being out by myself in the backyard at one o'clock in the morning. Your children obviously are a big part of your life as well. Are yeah. they, they budding scientists too? Yeah, I mean they, they'll they'll cut their own path, I guess, and and I I'm keen to push them towards science. But of course they'll do what they want to do. But they should do English and PE as well. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'll physical exercise and writing. <laughs> Right up there. <laughs> no, my, my daughter, she loves looking through telescopes. She likes being out with me at night time, looking at the sky, which is really cool. My son, not so much. He's, he likes books. He loves history. He loves physics. 
nuclear physics right now, um, which he loves. One thing that's changed since I was a kid is now that now there are great books you can buy, I guess getting back to science communication, from scientists where they've broken down a really complex subject into a really digestible way. So there are great kids' books out there for teaching really complex subjects, and, and I love doing that with kids. Would you say that they're your greatest experiment so far? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I often have thought that. What you do with children is hugely influential. If you think back to your memories of your mum and your dad, that shaped who you are today. And that's always on my mind, that what I do with my children will shape them for the future. So when you look way into the distance when the time comes that you retire, yeah. what do you want to be able to look back and say? I guess I, I argue with my wife about this. I never want to retire. <laughs> so or argue with your wife. Yeah. <laughs> what do I want to say? What do I want to accomplish? I, if I could say that we took autophagy as a tool for helping us to understand aging and to, to slow biological aging, and, and if I can say that that reduced age-related diseases like dementia, then I would be very happy. Uh, with that yeah it's a good goal to have yeah (laughs) absolutely thanks Tim cheers if you want to learn more about Samri and the researchers working to build a brighter healthier future for you and your family head to samri.org.au